Hello everyone, a very good morning and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. Before we begin, we have an important announcement. This Sunday, we shall be conducting the Baiju's national scholarship test that is on the 16th of July at 11 a.m. And the link for the scholarship test is provided in the description box below. If you attempt the test, you stand a chance to win up to 90% scholarship on our IAS courses. So if you're interested, just head to the description box below to find the registration link for the scholarship test. So let's begin with the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper by first looking at the topics that we are going to discuss today. I have chosen five important editorials and columns for a detailed discussion and a couple of small articles which are more relevant for our prelims examination. So let's cover all these topics in complete detail. And if you benefit from these initiatives, all you have to do is support us by pressing the like button, share your comments, share these videos with other aspirants, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. So let's begin with the first article for today. We shall look at this editorial on page number six that is related to Indian polity. The article is dealing with a recent judgment of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court of India, a couple of days ago, delivered a very important judgment in which it has taken action against the repeated extension that the government was giving to the tenure of the Director of Enforcement Directorate. As you know, Enforcement Directorate is a very important central investigating law enforcement agency. And the director of ED had been given repeated extensions in his tenure. This was in contravention to the established guidelines of the Supreme Court of India. So a couple of days ago, the Supreme Court has struck down any such extensions which are in contravention to the established guidelines. But however, it has upheld few amendments that were done in this regard a couple of years ago. So that's, that brings into question the autonomy of these important law enforcement agencies such as ED and as well as the CBI. Even the CBI, which is a premier law enforcement agency, has been facing similar controversies regarding the repeated extension of the tenure of the director. The government has often extended the tenures beyond the mandated limits and this gives rise to suspicion or concerns that the autonomy of these institutions could er get eroded because of this as the directors could be forced to toe the line of the government and favor the government when they are in a position of power in return for extension of tenure. So this creates a vested interest and as a result there has always been a concern regarding the autonomy, the independence of these key law enforcement agencies. So let's examine this topic in complete detail. First let's talk about enforcement directorate, let's talk about the CBI as well and then talk about the concerned issue which has come up recently. The Enforcement Directorate or the ED is a top law enforcement agency of the central government that fights economic crimes and enforces certain important economic laws. It was established in the year 1956 under the Department of Economic Affairs to mainly tackle foreign exchange violations under the FERA Act of 1947. Later it has been transferred to the Department of Revenue under the Finance Ministry and today it is enforcing two very very important legislations which is FEMA, the Foreign Exchange Management Act that replaced FERA and more importantly the PMLA, the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Under the PMLA, the Directorate of Enforcement or ED is the nodal agency to investigate money laundering cases in the country. As you know, money laundering is a major economic offense and also a risk to country's national security because money laundering is linked with organized crime, terror financing, etc. In this regard, ED gets tremendous powers under the PMLA to not just investigate these cases of money laundering, but also to confiscate the proceeds of the crime, to attach the proceeds of money laundering to the ongoing case. And the ED has been given tremendous powers with regard to arrest, seizure of evidence and attaching of property to the ongoing cases through the PMLA. 
So as a result, ED becomes a very, very important law enforcement agency. In the last 10, 15 years, it has dealt with many high profile economic crimes involving money laundering and other violations of Foreign Exchange Management Act. Now, if you look at this important institution and how the director of ED is appointed, there is a set process for this. For appointing the director of enforcement directorate, the government has to consider the recommendation of a committee which is headed by the CVC. Before the government appoints the director of ED, the names recommended by the committee headed by the Central Vigilance Commissioner has to be taken into account and based on the recommendation, the appointments are to be made by the government. This committee, this appointment committee also consists of vigilance commissioners, the other vigilance commissioners as members, including secretaries from Home Ministry, DOPT and the Revenue Department. All these top secretaries of Government of India are part of this committee, which is headed by the CVC. The name recommended by this committee is finally forwarded for appointment by the Government of India. Usually the tenure of the ED director was fixed at two years. But recently the government has extended this going all the way up till almost five years of tenure for the director of enforcement directorate. Now, if you look at the CBI, the Central Bureau of Investigation, which is a premier law enforcement agency of the government of India, the CBI also faces a similar controversy. The CBI, if you look at its history, it was established under the colonial government in the war department, mainly to tackle corruption within the war department during Second World War. Earlier, it was known as the Delhi Special Police Establishment. It was established as the special police establishment to tackle corruption cases within the war department. Later, it was given some legal backing through the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act in 1946. And it became the primary institution to tackle corruption at the central government. So post independence, India inherited this institution, that is the DSPE. And it was later renamed and reconstituted as the CBI in 1963 through a government resolution. Without adequate legal backing, the government brought out a resolution through which the CBI was constituted in 1963. Since then, CBI has mainly dealt with corruption cases within the central government. And over a period of time, since it was considered as a premier investigating agency, it was handled many other high profile cases as well. It has dealt with organized crime, economic offenses, especially manipulation in the stock markets. It has even dealt with terror cases, including the Rajiv Gandhi assassination case. It has also dealt with many high profile kidnappings, rapes, murders, etc. So over a period of time, CBI became a master of none and a jack of all. It was dealing with all types of high profile cases without developing specialization in any of them. Along with that, it was accused of frequent politicization and misuse by the ruling party. Now, if you look at the structure of the CBI, organizationally, it is placed under the Ministry of Personnel, Public Grievances and Pensions. It's under the DOPT, the Department of Personnel and Training. So this allows the Prime Minister to exercise direct supervision of the CBI as the Prime Minister heads the ministry. Even though there is a Minister of State, the Prime Minister does exercise direct control over the Ministry of Personnel. And this always led to allegations since many years that the ruling party would misuse the CBI's powers through the office of the Prime Minister through the Ministry of Personnel. By making selective appointments and by politicizing the organization, it has been alleged that CBI has often been used by the ruling parties to target opposition parties, to target state governments ruled by opposition parties. This allegation has stuck with the CBI because there are many credible incidents where these allegations have been shown with prima facie evidence. In fact, the Supreme Court itself had called the CBI a caged parrot, an institution which is singing the tunes of its master, that is the ruling party. So this accusation against the CBI 
that ruling parties have often misused the institution arises mainly because of its structure, the way in which the director is appointed and how the tenure could be extended. Now when it comes to the appointment process here for the director of CBI, there is a well laid out procedure. There is a transparent procedure laid out. In fact, it's not the discretion of the government when it comes to appointing the CBI director. There is an appointment committee headed by the Prime Minister of India along with the leader of opposition in the Lok Sabha and the Chief Justice of India. If there is no leader of opposition, then the leader of the single largest party will be part of the committee and Chief Justice of India can nominate any other Supreme Court judge as well in case he is not available. So this has been codified under the Lokpal Lokayukta Act through provisions provided under the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act and through amendments made into the Lokpal Lokayukta Act. The CBA director's appointment has been very well laid out. Appointment will be done by this committee headed by the PM, which also consists of leader of opposition and the Chief Justice of India. Then through the CVC Act, a fixed tenure for CBI director has been provided for two years. In fact, this is based on a previous judgment of the Supreme Court in the landmark Vineet Narayan case of 1997, when the Supreme Court ruled that security of tenure is important to provide independence to the director of CBI. The Supreme Court, which was looking into allegations that CBI is being misused and politicized, it saw that if the director is given security of tenure of two years, if the director is sure that he won't be removed or transferred, then the director can function freely, independently, thus protecting the autonomy of these key institutions from any possible misuse by the ruling party. Keeping this in mind, the Supreme Court ruled in Vinit Narayan case that CBA director should be given a mandatory tenure of two years. This was to secure the independence of the institution. This was codified through the CVC Act of 2003, where it has been clearly mandated that CBI director will have a tenure of two years. There are other Supreme Court directions as well. In 2019, for example, the Supreme Court had ruled that no officer with less than six months tenure to retire will be considered for the post of CBI chief. This is to ensure that officers who are about to retire are not given a unnecessary extension because that again creates a vested interest. If the government is promising the post of director of CBI at the last phase of uh, officer's tenure, then he or she might be motivated to favor the government in those last few months in order to win the post of the CBI director. And further, the post uh, tenure can be extended as well for at least two more years. So to prevent this, the Supreme Court had directed that no officer with less than six months remaining in their tenure shall be appointed as the director of CBI. The court also ruled that director is to remain in office for not less than two years and can be transferred only with the consent of the appointment committee. The whole idea here was to secure the tenure for the director so that the institution can be independent and autonomous from the ruling party. But now the government has made a change. Let's understand this in more detail. Let's talk about the recent changes that have been made to the tenure of the director of ED and CBI and how this creates a constitutional question. See, the current case the Supreme Court was looking into, it dealt with the repeated extension of tenure that was given to Sanjay Mishra, the current director of enforcement directorate. SK Mishra was first appointed as the director of ED back in 2018. Imagine it's been five years and since five years Sanjay Mishra has remained the director of ED. How? How is this possible? It's been possible because the government introduced an amendment in 2021 that provides for extension of tenure to the directors of investigating agencies up to three more years. Apart from the guaranteed tenure of two years, three additional years of tenure was added, provided if the extension is done every single year. So essentially, the director of organizations like ED and CBI, they can remain in this post for five years. The two years guaranteed through law and by Supreme Court directions. And after that, they can enjoy another three year tenure if the extension is done every year. 
every year if the tenure is extended beyond the two year tenure the director can have up to three more years so in total the director can remain in the post for five years now if such repeated extensions are provided the concern is that these officers might be forced to toe the line of the government favor the ruling party listen to the political masters and use the organization rather misuse the organization for political purposes so that they keep getting extensions in their tenure right and that suspicion even if it doesn't happen in reality even that suspicion that element of suspicion is enough to cast apprehension about the independence and autonomy of these key institutions see before sk mishra's tenure was about to end back in 2020 the government gave another one year extension this was challenged at the supreme court by your ngo and the supreme court ruled that you can't keep providing such extensions to directors this erodes the independence of the institution and it contradicts previous judgments of the supreme court so to contradict the supreme court judgment the government of india amended the laws itself the cvc act and the delhi special police establishment act were amended in 2021 to provide a potential five year tenure to the director of CBI and ED. Through this amendment, that is the CVC amendment bill and DSP amendment bill, apart from the guaranteed two year tenure, additional three years were given, provided if the extensions are granted every year. This was supposed to be an exceptional provision. The government's argument was that there could be certain exceptional circumstances where in the interest of the public in the interest of ongoing investigations and cases sometimes the directors may have to continue in their post in the larger interest of the public in the larger interest of the nation so giving that as a reason the government justified the amendment the government said there could be exceptional circumstances where the director may have to continue in his or her post to take forward the investigations which are going on but this was supposed to be an exceptional provision and before granting such extensions the appointment committee has to approve such an extension this was made very clear but the government of india has gone ahead and given repeated extensions to sk mishra the current director of ed and he has been in this position for five years right now this is what had been challenged at the Supreme Court. The repeated extensions that had been granted to SK Mishra, this was under challenge. And the amendments that were done in 2021, those amendments were challenged on constitutional grounds. The NGO which had filed the petition had argued that these are unconstitutional amendments as it erodes the independence, autonomy of these key institutions, which in turn could erode the fundamental rights of our citizens. The Supreme Court which looked into the issue has passed a very important judgment and that is the focus of the editorial the supreme court has ruled the supreme court has ruled that if the tenure of the director is being extended beyond the two year period it can be done only in exceptional cases and this is not the sweet will of the government the government can't simply keep extending the term of the director this has to be approved recommended by the appointment committee by the committee which appointed the director in case of ed it is the committee headed by the cvc in case of cba director it is the committee headed by the pm these appointment committees have to recommend the extension only then the government can extend their tenure the supreme court has reiterated this position and hence it has asked SK Mishra to resign, to step down. But it has given him time till the end of this month in order to provide for a smooth transition. But by the end of this month, the current director of AD has to resign and step down because his extension of tenure is in breach of established norms and Supreme Court guidelines. While this is a positive development, the other aspect of the case which is the constitutional validity of these amendments, they have been upheld by the Supreme Court. 
in this ongoing case, there were two questions that were raised. One question was over the extension of the tenure of SK Mishra. Here the Supreme Court has ruled in favor of the petitioner and it has overruled the government. So it has asked SK Mishra to step down. But the other challenge was over the constitutional validity of these amendments that were done in 2021, which gives the director of ED and CBI a potential tenure of up to five years. This was argued to be unconstitutional. But the Supreme Court has not agreed with this. It has taken the side of the government and upheld these amendments because according to the Supreme Court, these amendments are not unconstitutional. They can't be struck down because for a law passed with the parliament to be struck down, there are two criteria which have to be met. One is the legislature which has brought out this law. If it does not have the competence to make the law in that particular domain. And the other case is where the law is contradicting fundamental rights. If there is a direct violation of fundamental rights through a law, right, then the law can be struck down by the Supreme Court as ultra wires the constitution. But in this case, the Supreme Court has felt that these amendments that were done, they are neither directly compromising fundamental rights and nor the parliament which enacted the law, it not, nor does it have the legal competence to bring out these amendments. Parliament of course has the legal competence. It does have the jurisdiction to carry out these amendments, right? And since the violation of fundamental rights couldn't be proven, right? The Supreme Court has upheld the constitutional validity of these amendments. But editorial is taking a stand. The editorial is expressing concern. It praises the Supreme Court for ensuring that SK Mishra steps down and ensuring that the extension of tenure is not misused by the government. But however, since the court has endorsed the tenure extension system provided to the constitutional amendments, or the changes that were done in 2021, this is where the editorial is expressing concern. The concern raised by the editorial is that by giving five year tenure to the directors, by providing for such piecemeal extensions, that is year by year extension, Essentially, the government is creating a incentive policy, a carrot and stick policy. That is the indirect message to the director is that if you favor the government during your role, during your tenure, you will be favored with an extension of one year term. If you don't, your tenure will end with two years. So such a vested interest is being created and this will cast aspersions on the very institution on the very independence and autonomy of the ED and the CBI. And that is the key question the editorial is raising. Because of late, there have been very serious allegations that the ruling party they often tends to misuse ED and CBI to target political opponents. So this indeed is a violation of fundamental rights, according to the editorial. It says that the Supreme Court, unfortunately, has not seen this link where the misuse of ED and CBI does lead to violation of fundamental rights, right? So that is the concern the article is bringing out. And it says that such extension of tenure is not conducive to rule of law. It simply allows the ruling party to misuse these key investigating agencies to target dissent, criticism and political opposition. That is the argument you need to understand. But don't take a one sided view. Please look at what the government is arguing as well. That's why I brought out the other side of the argument as well. The government stand is that such extensions might be needed in exceptional circumstances when important cases are being investigated. Because if suddenly there is a change in director, it could break the course of investigation. So government feels in public interest, it is necessary to extend the tenure. That is the government stand. The Supreme Court has upheld the constitutional validity of these amendments that were done in 2021. But critics are pointing out that this simply allows the ruling party to misuse these institutions for political reasons. Is that clear? So that is the understanding we should get from this important editorial. Now, let's take up a column from page number six that deals with the ongoing geopolitical tensions in the South China Sea. The author here is mainly talking about the tensions in South China Sea and this is being discussed in the context of India Philippines relationship. Because recently the foreign minister of Philippines, 
paid an important visit to India. He met with India's Foreign Minister, Dr. Jai Shankar. This happened just a few weeks ago. And following this important visit, India Philippines have entered into a new security arrangement. They have come out with new initiatives, which is mainly focused on maritime security, defense cooperation and strategic relations. So in this context, the writer is examining the larger South China Sea issue as Philippines is affected by Chinese aggression in the South China Sea. So let's examine this topic in complete detail. Let's talk about India Philippines relationship, the recent developments that have taken place that in the defense and strategic domain. And let's also talk about the South China Sea issue. Philippines has increasingly become a strategic partner for India. Philippines has a direct dispute, a standing dispute with China in the South China Sea. There are constant tensions, including military tensions between China and Philippines. China has claimed few islands that belongs to Philippines, according to international law. China has used military aggression to threaten Philippines as well. It has disrupted Philippines rights in its exclusive economic zone. Chinese naval and coast guard vessels, they have targeted the fishing vessels of Philippines and even sunk them. And it has prevented Philippines from exercising its economic rights in its own exclusive economic zone. So there are a lot of tensions between these two countries and Philippines has naturally sought out India as a counterbalance to this. Last year, India Philippines have signed a historic deal to export the BrahMos cruise missiles. As you know, BrahMos is a joint venture between India and Russia. It's one of the most advanced and fastest cruise missiles in the world. It's known for its accuracy, known for its uh, application in targeted precision strikes. India has agreed to source, that is to export BrahMos to Philippines to strengthen its naval capabilities. This comes in the context of China-Philippine standoff in the South China Sea. Now, during the recent visit of the foreign minister, several new initiatives and announcements have been made. This includes the opening of a defense attache office in Manila, which allows Indian defense attaches to be stationed in Manila. All right, this helps in taking forward the military to military relationship including military sales and military trade, that is defense trade. In diplomatic relations, this is a common practice. Just like diplomats are, career diplomats are appointed in each other's embassies, uh, consulates, etc. Defense attaches are also not po posted to take forward the military relations and the defense trade between the two countries. So India Philippines have decided to open a resident defense attache office in Manila, which is the capital of Philippines. And this is clearly designed to promote the military relations and the defense trade between the two sides. They've also signed an agreement to promote cooperation between the coast guards of two countries. And they are focusing mainly on maritime security and disaster response through enhanced military training and joint exercises. They're going to plan joint training exercises specifically between the two navies and coast guards and they're planning joint military exercises as well focused on maritime security and HADR operations. That is humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations. They have also signed a deal which will allow Philippines to procure naval assets from India through a concessional loan that will be provided by India. India provides these concessional loans known as line of credit. It's a concessional loan with very flexible interest rates and flexible repayment period that India provides to various countries as part of its foreign policy. So Philippines is being provided with a concessional line of credit through which Philippines can draw money and procure naval assets from India and then repay the money at relatively flexible terms back to India. All these initiatives, they clearly signify the growing strategic security and defense relations between the two countries. They have also commenced a maritime dialogue with each other. This is a clear signal with regard to the growing defense and strategic ties between India and Philippines. Now this becomes extremely important given the tensions that are prevalent in South China Sea. 
given the direct standoff between Philippines and China that exists. Because both India and Philippines have taken a stand that the Indo-Pacific region should remain free and open. This is a principle that India believes in. India believes that the rules-based order which is defined by international rules, international law such as the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea such international rules and laws should be upheld, should be followed by everyone and ensure that there is free and open access and navigation in the Indo-Pacific. This is a clear message to China because China is the one which has been extremely aggressive in breaking the rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific. Particularly in South China Sea, China has raised these unsustainable claims, territorial claims with other countries, which is in violation of UN clause or the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. It has disrupted freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight for the vessels and aircraft of other countries, thereby threatening the international rules-based order. So these tensions could easily turn into a bigger conflict which could destabilize entire South China Sea. And South China Sea is critical for the global economy and it's critical for India as well. That's why India works with the Quad grouping, the quadrilateral, to work with countries like US, Japan and Australia, all of which are like-minded countries to enforce the rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific. So during the foreign ministers meeting, India has reiterated this stand, this position, that South China Sea issue has to be resolved peacefully through diplomatic methods and legal methods, not by resorting to military aggression. It has urged support for Philippines in this context to support free and open navigation and overflight in the South China Sea. So this brings us to the question of what's happening in South China Sea? What is the dispute all about? Why are there such high tensions in South China Sea? So let me take you through this so that you have a complete understanding of this topic. Now, if you look at the map, it's a very important map that you're actually looking at. This is where South China Sea is located. It essentially connects the Indian Ocean over here with the Pacific Ocean. It is a critical route. It is a very important sea lane of communication that connects the Indian Ocean via Strait of Malacca. This is the Malacca Strait near Singapore. So via Malacca Strait, South China Sea is linking Indian Ocean with the Pacific Ocean. Today's global economy, global geopolitics is largely centered around the Indo-Pacific. Large part of global trade, a large part of global oil supplies is passing through South China Sea. Is that clear? A lot of India's exports and imports also passes through South China Sea. A large percentage of our exports and imports is passing through this sea route. And more importantly, South China Sea is blessed with precious resources. It is said to have hydrocarbon reserves. It is blessed with fisheries and also precious minerals potentially including rare earth minerals as well. So there are plenty of resources present here and it is a vital sea lane of communication linking Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. Large part of the global trade and global oil supplies are passing through the South China Sea. So no wonder China wants to exercise greater control over this water body. But however, when it comes to maritime boundaries, maritime jurisdiction, the maritime boundaries are defined under international law through the UN clause, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea that came into force from 1984. This is what countries follow while demarcating their maritime boundaries where they identify different maritime zones such as territorial waters, contiguous zone, exclusive economic zone, etc. Under the UN clause, a country will have complete jurisdiction and powers within its territorial waters that extends up to 12 nautical miles from its coastline. Then exclusive economic zone which usually extends up to 200 nautical miles going up to 350 nautical miles. In this region the country will have exclusive economic rights. 
over all the resources present in the EEZ, the coastal state will have complete rights over the economic resources and other countries can't exploit them. Within territorial waters, the country will have complete jurisdiction. All the laws of the country can be applied within the 12 nautical mile range. So such maritime boundaries are clearly defined and demarcated through UN clause. This ensures that conflicts and disputes can be prevented. But China has refused to follow the UN clause provisions and based on historical claims, historical records, China has tried to claim the whole of South China Sea to itself. As China has risen as a major global power and now it is challenging the US for the position of the global superpower, right? there is direct confrontation between the two superpowers. And China wants to exert its dominance in the Indo-Pacific by gaining control over South China Sea. Because China obviously is interested in the resources present here. And it wants to control the trade, the shipping movement between Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So as a result, China drew this line. You can see a U-shaped line here in this map. There are nine dashes used to depict this. So it's called the nine dash line drawn by China. This is an imaginary line that China has drawn based on historical claims. China has said since ancient times, various Chinese empires and dynasties like the Song dynasty, for example, they had unrestricted access and control over the South China Sea. Based on such historical claims, it's claiming whole South China Sea to itself. Right. But this logic is not sustainable in today's world, in modern world. Because in today's world, we have international laws that define boundaries, not historical claims. By that logic, India should claim large part of Indian Ocean to itself. But we can't do that because we follow our international rules based order. And accordingly, we have delineated our maritime boundaries. But China being a expansionist aggressive power refuses to follow the international rules and it has drawn this so called nine dash line to claim the almost the whole South China Sea to itself. Now this directly overlaps the jurisdiction of other countries in Southeast Asia. Let me show you another map so that you can clearly understand the territorial dispute. If you look at this island group called the Parasil group of islands. It technically belongs to Vietnam, according to UN clause provisions. It is part of Vietnam's EEZ. But China claims Parasil Islands to itself and it has a standing dispute with Vietnam. Similarly, with Philippines, China has claimed the Scarborough Shoal and Mischief Reef. Even though according to UN clause, they actually belong to Philippines. You can see the Spratly group of islands over here in this part of South China Sea. This actually belongs to Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei and Vietnam. But China is unilaterally claiming all of Spratly Islands to itself, thereby leading to a dispute with all these Southeast Asian countries. China has multiple disputes going on. It has a direct dispute with Vietnam over Parasil Islands, dispute with Philippines over Scarborough Shoal and dispute with Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, Vietnam and others with regard to Spratly group of islands. Now, when it comes to the Scarborough Shoal dispute, there was an interesting development in 2016. Philippines, which was the affected party, it approached the PCA, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which is an international tribunal recognized under UN clause to resolve such maritime disputes. To resolve maritime disputes under UN clause, the PCA has been recognized as an arbitration mechanism, the permanent court of arbitration, which is headquartered at uh, The Hague in Netherlands. So Philippines filed a case against China, pointing out that China is breaking international rules because China has not only claimed these areas in contravention of UN clause provisions, it has even resorted to aggression and illegal methods to consolidate its illegal claims. Chinese Navy, Chinese Coast Guard, they frequently threaten other ships and vessels and aircraft. They intercept them. They have even sunk the fishing vessels of other countries. China has even tried building artificial islands to further its claims. 
and it has been turning these artificial islands into military bases to strengthen its military position. These acts of China, they are clearly illegal. They are aggressive acts. And hence, Philippines had approached the PCA. In this historic case, the PCA ruled in favor of Philippines. That is what you need to understand. In the 2016 case at the PCA, the ruling went in favor of Philippines. The award was given in favor of Philippines. The PCA ruled that according to all available records and according to international law, Scarborough Shoal belongs to Philippines and not to China. Is that clear? And this ruling is final and binding because UN clause is legally binding on all UN members. But despite this, China rejected the award. China refused to follow the terms of the award. Even today, China has not given up its claims over Scarborough Shoal, despite this ruling of the PCA. However, it's very important to note that PCA did not comment about the illegal activities that China is doing. It did not ask China to stop its aggressive activities, its construction of artificial islands, etc. It only ruled that Scarborough Shoal belongs to Philippines, not to China, and it dismissed the historical claims of China. Even though this part of the award is binding, and China was supposed to follow this as a UN member, it has rejected the award, which clearly shows the expansionist aggressive tendencies and intentions of China. It's in this context that the growing relations between India and Philippines is extremely important. Now, with regard to South China Sea dispute, what is the solution? What's the way forward? The solution has to come from the region itself. Since multiple Southeast Asian countries are affected, one country alone cannot come out with a solution. Philippines is not strong enough to stand up against China. Vietnam alone is not strong enough to stand up against China. So the regional grouping, that is ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, this group has to come together. All the members, especially Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, they all have to unite and work towards a political solution. They have to push China diplomatically, put that diplomatic pressure and work out a code of conduct so that every country in the region can follow an established code of conduct. Because see, legal route is not viable. We have already seen China does not follow the legal route. It does not respect the awards given by international tribunals. It only leads to further tensions and hostility. The military aggression route is definitely not viable because that could turn into a bigger conflict which will completely disrupt and even destroy the global economy. So India is deeply concerned about these consequences. That is why India has insisted for a peaceful conflict resolution. That is why India has sent out a strong message by asking Philippines to ensure that international law is respected, international law is followed, and India has given complete support to Philippines in this regard. It's basically an indirect message from India to China that we expect all the countries here to follow the international rules. So this should push the ASEAN countries, the ASEAN group to work together and put that diplomatic pressure on China to come out with a political framework, to have a code of conduct so that the basic rules are respected and followed to prevent these tensions from escalating into a bigger conflict. This is a very, very important topic in international relations. You can expect a mains question or maybe even an essay topic on this. Now, moving on, in the same page, we have a very interesting and a very important column written by Shashi Tharoor. He talks about the colonial loot, the colonial plunder of India's wealth, India's cultural artifacts. And he discusses whether there is a need for any reparations to be paid by Britain. This is in the context of Netherlands, which has taken a decision to return some of the artifacts that were stolen during the Dutch colonial period back to Sri Lanka and Indonesia. Is that clear? Recently, the Dutch government has announced an initiative that around 400 plus stolen cultural artifacts, which were stolen by the Dutch colonial uh, empire from Indonesia and Sri Lanka, will be returned back to those countries. In this context, 
Shashi Tharoor is examining what Britain has done. What Britain has done for India, given the scale of the loot and plunder that the British colonialists did in India. In fact, Shashi Tharoor has written wonderful books on this. He has written a book called The Era of Darkness. And he also brought out another book, The Inglorious Empire. In both the books, he illustrates the atrocities of the British colonial empire. It's without doubt that British colonial rule destroyed India's culture, India's society, India's economy. And they did the same in every other colony, be it in Africa, be it in the Pacific Islands or in the Caribbean, right? In every colony, the British, they destroyed the local society, the local economy and culture and inflicted deep trauma. It directly led to violation of human rights. Thousands and thousands of people have been killed because of colonial rule, right? The hurt, the pain carries forward even to this day, according to Shashi Tharoor. He says that given the atrocities that were done, given the scale of the mistakes that were committed, it's only just for others to demand that Britain should apologize for what happened, correct those mistakes, atone for those mistakes and issue a formal apology, if not providing for reparations. Reparations is nothing but when atrocity has happened, the abuser apologizes for the act to the victims and pays a financial compensation. That is what we call as reparation. For example, for the horrors committed to the Jews during Holocaust, Germany kept apologizing for it. In fact, there is one very popular incident. In 1970s, the Chancellor of West Germany, he was visiting Poland and as you know, in Poland, many of the gas concentration chambers were located under Hitler's Nazi Germany. That's where millions of Jews were slaughtered. So the Chancellor of Germany, he went down on his knees. He sat down on his knees to apologize to the Polish Jews for the horrors that the previous German government had committed. Is that clear? This apology goes a long way in repairing the harm, the, the damage, the trauma that has been inflicted on an entire community. There are many other instances. Take for example, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Recently, he apologized for the Komgat Maru incident in which Indian immigrants, mainly Sikhs, were turned back by the then Canadian authorities, which pushed many of them to their death. So recently, Canada apologized for this particular incident. And there are many such examples. Japan has been very apologetic about the atrocities committed under Imperial Japan. Is that clear? So we can go on with regard to slavery, right? There are few European colonies and, and even US and others which have expressed uh, at least concern and regret about the atrocities that their ancestors had, co had committed. But Britain has never done this. Forget returning the artifacts. Britain teaches wrong history to its own children. If you look at British history books, colonialism is glorified. The horrors of colonialism is hidden and in British schools, children are taught about how Britain enlightened the world through colonialism. This is the point that Shashi Tharoor is raising. It's not just about returning the wealth. It's not just about returning the Kohinoor diamond or other precious artifacts. It's not just about paying some compensation. You can never quantify the losses that people of India and other people of colonies have suffered. Right? The financial losses, the cultural loss and the human loss. You can never quantify that. You can't put a sum on that. But a token of apology for what has happened and correcting those mistakes will go a long way in preventing such things from happening in the future. That's why Shashi Tharoor is calling for a moral reparation, not financial reparations. He's not asking for financial compensation, even though it has been paid in other contexts. For example, US has paid reparations to African slaves. There are many such examples. European countries have paid reparations to other colonies for the horrors they had committed. They have paid financial compensation. Is that clear? In US, for example, there was a medical experiment which was done, targeted against the black community. For the horrors and human rights abuses committed by ancestors, right? The US government took responsibility, apologized for it and paid reparation to the families which were affected. Here, Shashi Tharoor is not demanding a financial reparation, right? Of course, he's not ruling it out, but he is not demanding it. 
he is demanding a formal apology and a moral atonement of the mistakes committed by the ancestors. See, no one is saying that current Britain is responsible for the colonial blunders. That is not the point. It's also very important to note that we are not saying that the current circumstances of India is all because of colonial rule. Right? A lot of time has passed. We are not saying that all problems in India will get solved if Britain apologizes and pays reparations. That's not the point. It's also not the point that just returning the artifact, artifacts will somehow correct for all the horrors that have happened. It's about a symbolic gesture. Shashi Tharoor actually has some very innovative suggestions here. He's suggesting that British history has to be refined. The history which is taught to British children should highlight the colonial horrors. This has been done in Germany. In Germany, in German schools, school children are taken to the concentration camps to show the horrors that Jews had suffered during Holocaust. So that from an early childhood, a German kid learns about the Holocaust, the horrors committed by Nazi Germany. Of course, the current people of Germany are not to blame. The current government cannot be blamed for what Nazi Germany did. But the token, the symbol of apology and gesture goes a long way. So in Germany, in the schooling system, the kids are taught practically by taking them into the gas chambers to make them experience that, that horror and that environment. So what Shashi Tharoor is suggesting is that there should be a museum in Britain. A museum depicting the loot, the plunder, the horrors committed by the colonial rule. He is asking for better history to be taught to British children. Not just highlighting the achievements, but showing the horrors and human rights violations as well. And a formal apology, a formal note of apology from Britain. And followed by a return of cultural artifacts, because that does hold cultural significance in colonies like India. So that is the key argument that Shashi Tharoor is making. I feel it's a very important argument as far as history and even international relations are concerned. The topic of colonial plunder, reparations, return of cultural artifacts is a trending topic. Right? Recently, US also, along with Australia and few other countries, have signed agreements with India to return cultural artifacts back to India. In that context, the topic could be very, very important for your means. Next. We have two small articles on page number eight. Let's look at them one by one. This article here deals with a proposal made by Try for partially banning few mobile applications. The Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, which is the regulator of the telecom sector, it has sought inputs from the industry. It has sought inputs from the industry. regarding how a selective ban can be imposed on certain applications on certain part of the internet traffic in order to deal with security and law and order situation. Because as you know, despite all the benefits of the internet and social media platforms, these platforms can be potentially misused as well to spread fake news, to instigate riots, to trigger unrest, this is a security challenge, a law and order challenge. So India expects social media firms, internet service providers, the tech companies to cooperate with law enforcement agencies. But whenever things go out of hand, when there is widespread violence which has broken out in a particular region, India is known to shut down internet in the entire district or in the entire state. And in fact, India has become quite notorious for doing this. India has become known as the internet shutdown capital of the world. Especially in the last few years, majority of the internet shutdowns are happening in India. For example, take the latest development in Manipur. Because of the ethnic violence all from almost two months, Manipur is off the internet grid. In Punjab, when Amrit Pal Singh and pro Khalistan activities got escalated a couple of months ago, for several weeks internet was suspended. In 2019 in Jammu and Kashmir, when Article 370 was revoked and JNK was reorganized. For almost two years, internet was suspended in JNK. There are many other parts in India, in Karnataka, Maharashtra, Telangana, right, even in West Bengal and Kerala, where in districts or in entire states, repeatedly internet has been suspended, apparently to deal with law and order situation and security situation. This makes India the internet shutdown capital. Even when compared to authoritarian dictatorial countries, 
India comes out at the top and the irony is India is a democracy. So there's a lot of criticism here that India shuts down the internet. It provides for a blanket shutdown of the internet, which is a violation of fundamental rights, including Article 19 that covers right to free speech and expression. That's why the try is trying to find another solution here. Instead of imposing a blanket ban on the internet, it is seeing whether we can impose selective ban on certain applications, on certain features of an application. So try has invited inputs from the industry and from all the stakeholders to see whether a partial ban is feasible so that we don't have to ban internet across an entire district or an entire state. Is that clear? This proposal had been considered before as well. Back in 2015 and 2018, even then try had considered regulating messages on social media platforms like WhatsApp, Twitter, etc. But the problem here is that enforcing such bans is technically impossible because the internet being a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network it becomes almost impossible to shut down the internet you can shut down your ISPs your internet service providers can be stopped from providing services certain specific websites can be blocked through ISP gateways but you can't prevent access to what is there on the internet is that clear because there are many different ways in which the internet can be accessed by using proxy servers, by using VPNs, virtual private networks. People can bypass all the bans, all the restrictions and they can still access the internet. That's why the article is arguing that selective ban is not feasible. It may not work. You can ban maybe few websites, you can block maybe few applications, but despite the ban, there are other routes through which you can still keep accessing the applications. By using proxy servers and VPNs, it's always possible to gain access to the internet, despite what the government does. Right? That is the strength and weakness of the internet. Right? The beauty of internet is it is truly democratic. No single country controls it. No government can ban access to the internet entirely. At the same time, that is the biggest weakness as well of the internet as it is prone to misuse by hostile and anti-national elements. So when it comes to VPNs, virtual private networks, where the user is routed through a proxy server located in another country, these VPN networks give anonymity to the user. They can hide their IP address, their location, their identity, and anonymously they can access the internet through virtual networks. India tried regulating VPNs a couple of years ago. Recently, CERT in Computer Emergency Response Team India, that is responsible for cyber security, brought out regulatory guidelines to regulate VPNs in India. VPNs were asked to maintain a log of all the data of all the registered users. This regulation led to a backlash by the VPN companies. They stopped providing services. They shut down their servers in India in order not to follow the regulations of India. But despite shutting down their servers in India, they are continuing their services from foreign servers. Because it's possible for them to bypass all the regulations and the bans and operate remotely, operate virtually and still have access to the Indian cyberspace. So the essence of the article is that such selective bans will not work. Partial bans on the internet will not give results because there will always be a route to access the internet. All right. So a better solution has to be thought about. Definitely shutting down the internet may become a necessity when there is a genuine security threat and a genuine law and order problem. But in a democratic country, you cannot have blanket bans extended for months and weeks together. Right? That is a direct violation of fundamental rights. So this is where India should find a balance. We should come out with a better regulatory policy, maybe a law through which we can regulate the security threats and these platforms so that the bans and the and the restrictions can be as minimal as possible while effectively dealing with the challenges, the security challenges. Got it? Now coming to the last article on page number 8, we have a very factual article related to the NRF, the National Research Foundation, which has been proposed by the government of India. It's a very big step in the field of science and technology to promote research and innovation in the country. Recently, the Union Cabinet has approved the introduction of a bill called NRF Bill, the National Research Foundation Bill, 
that will establish this institution called National Research Foundation. So let's know more about the NRF, some basic facts. The NRF is modeled on the lines of the National Science Foundation of the United States. In the US, you have a foundation called National Science Foundation, which is funded by both the government and the private industry. This provides grants for research projects. It encourages research and innovation at the level of universities and colleges. It brings universities closer to the industry. It allows industries to participate in research projects in universities and colleges. So that is the focus of the National Science Foundation of the US and in many other countries similar programs and initiatives exist. In all Western countries especially in Germany, UK, etc. They all have similar foundations through which research projects are funded and the whole research and development ecosystem is supported and, and, and uh, nourished through an institution such as a National Science Foundation. So India also is trying to replicate that model and this was one of the policy suggestions under the National Education Policy of 2020. Under NEP 2020, the government had proposed the establishment of NRF and now the bill has been approved by the Union Cabinet. So in the upcoming monsoon session, the bill is going to be introduced and very soon India will have a National Research Foundation. What will it do? It will primarily provide for grants to individual researchers, to postdoctoral candidates, to researchers in India. Direct support will be available where they can apply for grants for their research projects. It will bring the industry closer to universities and it will create the required R&D infrastructure and ecosystem. It will promote the culture of research and innovation at a university level. And 50,000 crores will be set aside for this. The budget is 50,000 crore rupees over five years, out of which 28% will come from the government, around 14,000 crore rupees. The rest, 72%, will come from the private sector. This is what the bill is going to mandate. The bill will define how the government will provide for funding for 28% of the fund and how the private sector will raise finances that should amount to 72% of the fund. In total, 50,000 crores will be made available over a period of five years. This is an incredible step, but still it's a very small step from India. Because when you compare this as a percentage of gross domestic expenditure on research and development or GERD, which is a key indicator, we are allocating less than 2% of our GERD. Out of the total expenditure on research and development, just 2% of it is going towards R&D, encouraging these grants. This is a very small number compared to other top economies which are leading in the field of research and development. When you compare this with US, China and others, India is many steps behind with regard to the investment we are making in research and development. But at least it is a good beginning. It will set aside a large sum of money to provide for research and development in India that could drive innovation in the country. So that is why NRF is very, very important, both for prelims and means. Now we move to the last part of today's discussion and take a look at a couple of articles that are more relevant from a prelims point of view. We have this article on page 10 referring to the European Parliament. And we have an article on page 13 that also refers to the European Parliament. This article is referring to a discussion that European Parliament is considering on the current crisis that's taking place in Manipur. Since there has been a lot of violence in Manipur, European Union has taken notice of this and the European Parliament has brought out a resolution to discuss the issue given that it represents a violation of rule of law, democracy and human rights. Because the EU is concerned about protecting democracy, rule of law and human rights. So it is considering to have a debate within the European Parliament. An urgent debate has been called for regarding the violence in Manipur. But India has rejected this. Indian diplomats have made it clear to European countries and the European Union that this is purely an internal issue of India and EU has no locus standi to comment or look into this issue. So that is a separate issue altogether. 
whether EU can look at this issue, what is India's stand, that's a separate issue altogether. But the point here is, what is European Parliament? Because there's another article in today's newspaper that refers to the European Parliament. This article on page 13. It refers to the biodiversity bill that EU Parliament is pushing through. To protect biodiversity, to protect <coughs> all the land and water based habitats and protect ecosystems. European Union is bringing out a fresh law that provides for protection and conservation of biodiversity. It's being called the Biodiversity Bill of European Union. This is facing a lot of backlash from conservative right wing sections. It's become a very controversial bill. So this issue also has been reported here on page 13. So both these articles are bringing European Parliament into news. So let me tell you a couple of important facts about the European Parliament. The European Parliament is one of the principal organs of the European Union. It's one of the principal organs. The EU, which is a regional grouping of European countries, it is made up of few principal organs. It has the European Council, the Council of Europe, European Parliament, European Court of Justice, European Central Bank, European Court of Auditors. All these are the key principal organs of the EU, including the European Commission. So here we'll talk about one of the organs of EU, which is the European Parliament. This is the legislative body. It's one of the legislative bodies of the European Union. It basically has lawmaking powers and controls the budget as well of the European Union. That is the power and authority of the European Parliament. The MPs to the Parliament, the members, are directly elected by the European constituencies. Is that clear? So it's one of the principal organs of the EU. It's one of the legislative bodies that has the powers to make laws and control budget. Clear? So there is one more legislative organ of the EU and I want you guys to find this out. I told you there are many principal organs of the EU. You have European Commission, you have European Court of Justice, Council of Europe, etc. Now please take a small exercise, a small homework. Read about the different organs of the EU and identify which is the other legislative body, which other organ of the EU has lawmaking powers and post this in the comment section below. Post all the principal organs, the names of all principal organs of EU and mention which of the organ has lawmaking powers which is shared with European Parliament. That is the assignment for you. Let's see how many of you do it. Now coming to the last article for today. On page 13, it's been reported that Pakistan has finally got some relief from its economic crisis. Since the last one year, Pakistan has been staring at a grave economic situation. It has run out of foreign exchange reserves, inflation has shot up in the country and Pakistan's economy was on the brink of collapse. So it has sought assistance from friendly countries and from multilateral institutions. It has got some financial support from China and recently its close West Asian allies, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates have announced a financial support of $2 billion and $1 billion respectively. All right. So along with China, Saudi Arabia and UAE, which are very close friends of Pakistan, they are bilaterally providing financial support to support the Pakistani economy. Other than this, Pakistan had approached IMF for financial support, the International Monetary Fund, which is one of the Bretton Woods institution along with the World Bank. The role of IMF is to help out such countries facing a financial crisis. For example, Sri Lanka, which witnessed a similar crisis, also has been taking support from IMF. India, which went through a balance of payments crisis in 1991, 1992, even we took support from the IMF. Many European countries, which went through economic crisis in the last 10, 15 years, even they have taken some support from the IMF. So IMF is this multilateral institution that provides for emergency credit funding. When countries are facing a sovereign default, when they're running out of foreign exchange reserves, when they are facing a liquidity crisis, that is when IMF steps in and provides a conditional bailout package. The condition is that 
IMF will lay out certain economic reforms. For example, it will force the country to devalue their currency. It will force the country to initiate economic reforms to liberalize and open up the economy for foreign competition. So any support from IMF is it's not it's not just free support. There are conditions that come along with it. You have to follow and implement those conditions. Only then you become eligible for a IMF package. India had suffered from this when we opened up our economy. We were forced to follow some IMF conditions, which was a violation of our economic sovereignty. But since we were in desperate need of financial support, we took in IMF support and brought out some changes as prescribed by the IMF. Right now, Sri Lanka is doing the same. Sri Lanka is restructuring its loans and opening up its economy and devaluing its currency as prescribed by the IMF. So now Pakistan also has got a final approval for a $3 billion loan from the IMF. Of course, it is conditional. Provided if Pakistan fulfills the conditions, it will be getting a support package of $3 billion, which is provided through SDR, Special Drawing Rights, which is the reserve currency of the IMF. SDR stands for Special Drawing Rights. It's a basket of foreign currencies that constitutes and creates a unique reserve currency for the IMF. So through SDR, Pakistan will be getting a $3 billion bailout package. And these are some basic points you have to pick up from this article. So this brings today's discussion of the Hindu newspaper to an end. I hope you guys have understood all the topics. I've tried covering them comprehensively with all the background that is needed. The idea is to ensure you don't have to go back and scratch your head regarding reading the newspaper again. Right? Just spend one hour, one hour, ten minutes with us and ensure that you cover the whole newspaper. If you guys are benefiting from this, do let us know in the comments, like the video, share it with others and do subscribe to the channel. Also take up the practice questions and head to our telegram channel as well because we have a quiz on some of these topics to help you revise. So that is it for today. I'll see you tomorrow. Till then, take care. Have a good day.